Hi everybody, thank you for joining me today. Today we're going to talk about uh, CSP. How is it uh, broken? How, what can we do to fix it? Or at least just demystify some of it. My name is uh, Amir Shaked. <clears throat> I work at uh, Perimeter X. I lead the R&D there. Um, software engineer for many years, R&D leader for a few as well. And, uh, and I love building things with good people. In this talk, we're going to talk a bit about breaking and building things and how they come together when we're talking about CSP. So, um, let's begin with a story. And I love to begin with stories. The story here is, I wanted to enable CSP on my website. I read and understood the full meaning of all the directives, now the documentation, the CSP2, CSP3, all the various, all the variances in the standards. Um, I added the header to the website with the report only uh, option and uh, started getting traffic uh, into uh, some uh, Lambda functions that consumed all the, all the um, reports. About a day later, uh, I went over the reports. It was very clear which report is what. I marked all the resources that are related, related to our website and uh, updated the policy. I switched the policy to block policy, which basically means no report, uh, but report, uh, blocking uh, policy. And I had zero issues. The website worked uh, flawlessly and, uh, and without any problem or anything uh, crashing, no support call to say some part of the website start, stopped working uh, somehow. And I think nobody ever said that story when it comes to CSP. Uh, I've talked to many, uh, many people in the industry who tried uh, to use this uh, really positive standard uh, with good intentions, uh, but everybody had some kind of issue along the way trying to implement it um, in their uh, website. More common case uh, that we have seen is uh, on, on several websites is a case where they're getting some call from their credit card company or another vendor they're working on, mostly the credit card company, so telling them that uh, there was a breach, uh, credit cards were stolen from their websites. And when they're doing the deep dive, uh, with usually with some consultant, when doing the deep dive, trying to identify where and what and how the breach was made, they end up finding that it's actually there was no direct breach to the site, but a, a breach to a third party vendor. And that vendor was responsible and it was basically injecting additional uh, code on the front end and sending data to some uh, new destination. Now, in practice, this is something that CSP by design should have stopped. And yet, uh, time and time again, we see these cases happening on, uh, on websites where even though that's, uh, that should have been in place and CSP in some cases was in place, still uh, the attack vector uh, succeeded and data was exfiltrated uh, from the site. Um, and uh, we'll, let, we'll touch on a few points on uh, why even though you have CSP, you don't usually have it all the way uh, and where there are gaps and, uh, and problems with that. So just in the word, what is CSP? And I'm going to do a short uh, technical session here on uh, what is CSP and how it's actually being, uh, being used and works. Um, so CSP is, is a policy, first of all, that's important to remember, it's a policy. Um, which adds another layer of security to the site, um, mostly to protect from XSS uh, and data injection and data exfiltration to uh, different domains. Uh, first introduced, by the way, all the way back in 2004. Um, but since 2013, 20, uh, the multiple iterations of uh, the common uh, um, standard that we have today, that we see today on many websites, with uh, the final version of, um, of version 3 um, pretty close to being finished. So it's a very late draft. And, uh, and version 2 is the one most commonly used today in websites with CSP. So how does it work? Basically, you have an HTTP header that you add on the backend, and you have two of those, and we're going to touch on the difference. The header says that you have, uh, in this example, what we have here. So we have default source saying self. Default source self means, um, by default, um, sources of different elements can come from the domain itself, the parent domain of uh, that serves the website. Scripts can come from two destinations, self and the CDN, cdnjs.net, another uh, network. 
And if there we see any kind of validation, the report uh, URL of where the data should go is the top level domain slash CSP logging. So that's the destination that will receive all the reports of all violations happening on the front end on different users to the CSP policy that we defined here. And then we have in the HTML page two elements, the image and the script, and both will work. The image will load because it's coming from on the default source, and the script will load because it's allowed as a script source on, the, on that specific directive. Now, if somehow, in some way, uh, the last element here would have been added, that um, that the directive that we had would uh, make that uh, forbidden, and we would have been receiving a report saying cdngs.com try to try to be accessed and to load a script. So, where is the problem with that? Um, once you go into specifications. The problem is they're not fully defined. And even though, going back here to this example, most of the directors are very well defined in what they should do and shouldn't do, it's still an RFC. It's still something that every browser needs to implement on their own. And nothing here says what should be the report. And I'm going to show, show example of where everything uh, is, uh, has all the variations. So what the report holds, for example, any every browser can decide what they want to push into reports. We do see an improvement there with uh, more consolidation, but again, there are variances uh, that we've seen uh, with different browsers reporting the same violation. When to report? Another interesting uh, point. Should I report only once? Should I report every time, per session, per page? Um, and that leads to a lot of inconsistency and uh, affects how the, system, uh, how the system that you're using can learn from that. Implementation itself may be lacking in different browsers. Uh, we're going to touch on a, on a few, on one example for a specific CVE, but there are a lot of other cases where the browsers don't implement that uh, complicated RFC uh, as it should. And it's usage dependent, and that can be abused. And we're going to do a deep dive uh, to an example of why, uh, by design, there is a flaw in the concept of a policy and a whitelist. So let's start with numbers. I think numbers talk better than anything else. How it's it's a standard that has been existing since 2012. How much uh, how much is it used? How often it is, and how everybody are using it. So this data is based on uh, information that uh, I extracted from HTTP archives, going over their scans on the past um, two years. Excellent data source if you want to research how the web changes and behaves over time, by the way. So an excellent data source to use. And what we have here is scan domains over time. And let me show it with the mouse. So we have scan domains over time. So that gives us the reference point of how many domains are being tested. And what we can see is that content security policy is actually being used more and more over time, which uh, signifies a positive trend until you're starting to dive into the details and you see what's the difference. Um, so we see a great adoption of other security headers. Uh, we have the, you can see the um, list here on the left, on the right, sorry, which different security headers uh, were found on those uh, scans. And, and we see that CSP is being adopted on the rise as more or less uh, about 10% of the websites. So it looks like a positive trend, but when you would deep dive to see what's actually being used along the different directives for CSP, these are the numbers that pop up when you're uh, inspecting. So we had 690,000 domains that actually used uh, CSP at all out of 4 million websites, uh, um, sorry, 6 million, 6 million websites that were scanned. And the first three are actually just a replacement of obsolete security headers that were common before. So the frame ancestors says uh, simply says, is do you allow the browser to load your website uh, in a frame or not? That's one. Upgrade insecure again a replacement says that uh, for existing for previous security header uh, mentioning. 
uh, that the traffic should only be HTTPS. So don't allow HTTP traffic to the parent domain, only HTTPS traffic, and block mixed content. So again, uh, an additional layer on that. Only the follow-up, uh, if you're going to default source, where it's actually getting interesting, um, actually use more um, complicated directives and trying to actually use the policy of where data should be loaded from or sent to, and that's only 17% out of the 620, uh, 90. That means a much lower number actually implementing CSP and trying to get all the value out of these um, directives. And that's a very sad uh, data point. And I think a really big part of it is some of the reasons that we're gonna talk on uh, later on, on the difference between the um, concept, which is great, and the difficulties in implementing it, uh, which makes it very hard uh, to be used uh, out there. So, and I'll give one example. Diving into the directives themselves that we see being used in the world, here is the one example. You see the default source. And there is a very big difference between the two options here. What you see on the top one is, on, on this one, is on their website allowing on the default source any unsafe eval, meaning anyone, any script can use eval and uh, basically run any code you want, and any inline code in the page. That basically means that between these two options, anything can run on the page. You didn't really uh, enable any additional security layer. You're allowing everything to run on the page. That's the worst kind. Um, on the far left of the security spectrum, you have actually nonsense of the hash of the script itself that should be allowed to run. And that's great. If you're using that feature, that means that uh, only specific scripts can run and inline scripts can run and not everything. So uh, being a very strict, great option, but very few websites actually use that one. Besides that, we've seen, again, deep diving into the data from actual websites, really poor usage. And I was looking for common uh, directives being used. And there should be around 30. And I found over 700 with some really mind-blowing examples here. I don't understand this goal for it. But then all kinds of just bad implementation. I don't know if it's the policy or the web servers. But it's really sad if somebody actually tried to use the policy and then broke it with invalid information in the policy itself. Um, if you're trying to use it, please, I beg you, use something like this link here, the CSP Evaluator by Google, which is really good, uh, and save yourself uh, the trouble of having uh, worked so hard to create a policy and then having it uh, be unavailable to websites because it has bugs in the, in the configuration. OK. So we talked a bit about the policy. Let's talk about the reports. I have a policy in place. I want to dissect the reports and understand them. And the data isn't normalized at all. Um, these two links here are actually fascinating when you're, if I'm inviting you to go and browse into them, and you will see different types of examples of reports um, coming in from uh, websites. And the reason is, you will get violations from a lot of stuff which are unrelated to the websites. And that can be very confusing when you're trying to understand. You see some uh, uh, two or three reports of some uh, domain, and you can't find how it's related to the website itself. And that could very well be coming from somewhere else, say extensions, and web proxies, bots, injecting code into the page, completely irrelevant to the policy and the website you actually built. So you need to find a way to reduce all that noise and focus only on the interesting reports. One way of doing that is by numbers. If the number of reports per uh, an incident, per domain, for example, is low or too low, it might be a good indication that it's noise and you can ignore that and focus only on the high number of reports. That's one, uh, one example that you can use. Um, but again, very interesting examples, and I invite you to go through them. I didn't want to do that, uh, waste our session for that. And the last is browser misalignments. And that's actually a very uh, big issue, and you should be aware of that. Different browsers do different things. 
This is uh, the latest information that I have. Uh, might have changed a long time because the browsers are always uh, updating the way they report. Um, but to, from our last test, we saw that these kinds of differences. I'll highlight only key ones. For Chrome, if you have a repetitive call to a blocked resource, you only get one report. Um, for Firefox, you will get repeating reports, so that's different. Um, with Safari, you might get only the truncate, truncated uh, top-level domain and not the full blocked URI, uh, which you might have wanted the full URI to see more information. So these kinds of differences make it very different to analyze the reports that you're getting between browsers and, like we saw here, between other things that might um, create noise. Leading to uh, a problem of essentially log spamming. Uh, there is no validation. There is no validation on who is sending the data. And anybody can uh, uh, push information into your system on uh, supposed uh, violations. It could be even fake reports uh, hitting directly um, your uh, API and reporting fake uh, um, CSP violations only to try and game your system. If you have, say, an automatic system that automatically whitelists uh, domains per number of occurrences, somebody can try and use that uh, to uh, and create uh, some adversarial uh, machine learning concept of tricking the system to whitelist a domain. Haven't seen that yet, but definitely a concept that uh, is out there uh, being discussed. OK. Um, Another thing is it has a, an implementation gaps, like everything. In this case, you can see the CVEs over time different uh, with different browsers, specifically mentioning CSP and the various uh, implementation that it has been uh, browsers. And I want to touch on one specific CVE that we uh, discovered and reported on uh, about uh, a year ago, and that is um, uh, this one. So using the above um, policy, which uh, seems very strict. Objects can be loaded from uh, nowhere and child's uh, from nowhere and scripts only from the parent domain. And the trick here is uh, we define a URL, obviously coming from an unauthorized uh, uh, location, and we're creating an element and then doing a, a child append with that element, and the script runs. And, and it doesn't run, sorry. And the script doesn't run. But if you're running the same thing uh, this way, this call will succeed and will be evaluated. And, uh, and the code will be loaded into the page. Why is that? Because of the complexities of how uh, the engine, the browser engine works. Uh, and it's quite complicated to create a very bulletproof uh, system. So this uh, is an example where even though you had a very strict policy, uh, we found a, a way where this, the code were still uh, running and loaded, even though it should have been uh, running. And that CV has been reported, has been closed, but it's just an example where even though you think you have a very strict policy, there might be a bug in the browser itself causing it to be uh, irrelevant. Um, an interesting point to make, websites that loaded, that used the nonces uh, for the inline scripts were not vulnerable to this bug because they were restricting uh, inline scripts to come only from those known uh, hashes, which is why um, this works on some websites and not on other websites that uh, were more strict in their policy. Um, the point to make here is that a very strict policy, a very good policy, might also protect you from potential bugs uh, in the browser's implementation. So what can possibly go wrong with the policy? Uh, we've talked a lot about uh, different uh, aspects of, um, of CSP, the implementation, the configuration. Um, but there is a core issue with the concept of a policy that makes it vulnerable. And I want to touch on that because it's a very interesting one. In this research, um, we took a different approach. We said, and this is over time, let's look at the most common allowed targets, whatever it's coming from, the script, the default, the object, whatever it is. These are the common allowed targets. And we can see here uh, a specific domain coming repeatedly. 
uh, Google Analytics on the different variations. Um, on March 2020, it was more common. It was common. On June 2021, it was way more common. Um, um, and I said, okay, let's pick the top one, um, the most commonly whitelisted domain on websites, and let's think what can we do with it, and how can we game the concept and abuse the, the CSP policy simply because that domain is whitelisted. And it's a fascinating one. Once you have a safe list, if the safe list is a generic destination where everybody can create an account in, nothing really protects you from sending different kinds of information. And the point to make here for Google Analytics is we added this code into the website that had CSP uh, with a very strict policy, but had uh, Google Analytics allowed. And essentially what this, um, this means is that we can send information to any ID that we want. Um, to show you here, where it is. So the TID, we can basically can define any ID that we want to send the information to, which is which will uh, allow us to see the information sent on our dashboard of Google Analytics and not another dashboard. And the example here is you saw the code creating, collecting the information and sending it. And we can see it here, very simple in the Google Analytics dashboard. We have the hash, we can dehash it. We have the username and the password being sent uh, from a website. Uh, that had a policy, but allowed Google Analytics. The next phase was, let's uh, try to protect it, maybe by query params or something else. How can we uh, at least improve the system? So wouldn't this be nice if we could have said, okay, you can connect to Google Analytics, but only to a specific target ID, not any target ID, and then you can protect the system. But you can't. And the, the quote from the, uh, the the RFC basically says the exact point. Query strings have no impact. They're not being uh, matched on, meaning you can't add that layer of protection. Um, and we are focusing here on Google Analytics, but it's important to remember, if we go back to this list, there are other domains here, which simply pick the top one and said, can anybody create an account, in this case, a completely free account, and use that to uh, exfiltrate information simply because it was whitelisted. But other domains here are easily, it, it's easily applicable for them as well, simply because the way the concept works um, of the safe list. And it's not just a theory. We published about, uh, a post about the method um, in June 17. And just a few days later, other security vendors found that specific uh, usage being used in the wild by attackers to exfiltrate information and, uh, and basically abuse that layer of protection coming from CSP. So think about it. We added all the layers of protection we configured a very strict policy. We made sure it is working properly. But the basic flaw is that one domain that we used is a generic domain that anybody can open an account on that top level domain. And that allows anybody to bypass all the protection that we were trying to add with CSP. That's it's basically it's crazy if you think about it. Now, one would claim that um, it might be valid, but where did the code come from? Um, so they might be able to abuse the destination, but can they abuse the source of the data? And that's an interesting point um, to be made. A very common uh, attack vector would be to target an open destination that you're using and replace their code. It could be a third-party vendor that you're using that you already whitelisted um, it could be obsolete domains, and these are examples that we've seen, uh, domains that were whitelisted. And because it's a whitelist policy, you don't get reports of the uh, part of the policy not being used. So you had a vendor, maybe a startup that you, you tested and you worked with, you added them, you try to see uh, how it works, maybe even use them for a while, they closed. The domain might even be up for sale. 
but uh, you did not remove it from your policy because of the way you know the process works between uh, say uh, devops and uh, front-end development uh, or whoever actually edited it it could be even you know, somebody from the marketing team and um, and the domain has been um, open for purchase and somebody could take over it so we saw examples of domains being the whitelisted that are no longer valid but uh, even taking an example uh, from earlier this year, 2021, where Cloudflare had uh, a bug was discovered in the CDNJS network that allowed an arbitrary uh, person to come in and replace code with any library that sits on the uh, CDN. That means that uh, the risk there was that anybody could create a hijack and replace the code. And if you're loading libraries from that specific destination, you could have been exposed potentially to such a risk. Now, that vulnerability was discovered and closed, so it's not uh, actively a risk. But there are other such uh, CDNs and, uh, and vendors that everybody are using that are always at risk. So um, the point to make here is both destinations are at risk because of the way the policy is defined since so the whitelist. So somebody can come in through an allowed uh, service and send exerted information to another allowed service in the policy. So where it went wrong? Um, it went wrong because, first of all, managing a policy, it's hard. It doesn't always hold in today's modern uh, web apps with the rate of, it, of changes and things being added. And the basic things of abusing the safe list uh, and to inject uh, code and extract information simply breaks the entire concept that sits behind CSP, kind of rendering it invalid, which is it's a very bad thing. So how can we make the best of it? Um, well, in, in coming to look at this problem, one would say, it's a terrible idea, don't use CSP, there is no value in it. So I wouldn't go that far because I gave examples, but once you understand the gaps, the potential gaps, you understand that CSP is a good layer of protection that you should add and what you should use it for, but it's not the holy grail, it doesn't stop everything, so you shouldn't count on it as the only thing that will protect you against XSS or data injection or uh, data exfiltration from the front end uh, of, uh, of the page. Um, so a few, uh, I would say, tips on how to make the best of it. So filtering the reports, definitely something that you should, uh, you should do and not spend your waste your time going over all the uh, violations. Um, A-B testing the policy, a, a wonderful concept. One way to uh, reduce the risk of having uh, obsolete domains in the policy is uh, doing A-B tests on the um, report-only policy. So you could have uh, a very strict report-only policy and constantly adding and removing domains from the list. And if you see that you have a domain that you don't get any reports on, that means that it's not all it's not being used anymore. That means you can remove it from the strict blocking policy because if you're not getting reports, and this allows you to test if a specific domain is uh, being used or not without damaging the experience of the users. So that allows you to keep a very clean and lean domain uh, domain list in the in the policy. Um, has different uh, levels of strict policy for different pages. A sensitive page, a page with a purchase, login, and things like that is definitely a place to have a very, very strict policy and also reduce the number of uh, libraries that you have there. The Google Analytics, as an example, let's not have it in a specific um, page that has a risk of, uh, of, of, that, uh, of, of that specific thing that we discussed. And if you don't have it, then you reduce the risk altogether and you can limit uh, the, the problem for specific pages with that uh, PII that you're trying to protect, not necessarily the entire website. Um, clean up every once in a while, that connects very well to the third point of how you can actually do it. Um, always consider adding additional layers of security, such as the nonce and the hashes for the inline scripts and the external scripts, again, 
it could sound very difficult and a lot of work, but if you limit that to um, sensitive pages, then the work is much, it's much smaller and it's very specific. So it's, it's more manageable, I would say, for a modern web app with multiple uh, components. Um, going back to being the same thing, context aware. And the last thing I really uh, wish any, anyone here in this uh, forum, uh, especially with this conference, the Con32, focusing on JavaScript, and, and I don't know how much you want, you like security, but it's a big part of what you can do with it on the front end. So contribute to the CSP3 with comments, and uh, I think any improvement can make this uh, better. Um, and that's it. Uh, a few takeaways just to consider in mind. So we talked about uh, schemers in a brief, those using the JavaScript to inject content and uh, uh, steal data from the website. Um, it's an increasing risk and you should take it in mind when you're adding and removing libraries into your website, uh, specifically JavaScript libraries that CSP is not a silver bullet, and we've covered very uh, extensively why, and that you should have the checklist for your own site, what you should do and which resources are critical, uh, yes or no. These are the three things I want you to take from this session. And I will have, I'll be able to answer questions on the Discord, or, um, or you can reach out to me if you want uh, later on. Thank you.